If I went back in time and told an old timer that every time they used a rest hold, I skipped it 10 seconds on the WWE network, do you think they would be upset? <laughs> uh, they probably ask you what the WWE network is and how do I get my royalties, to be really quite honest. They'd be more upset that they didn't get that 10 cents as opposed to you skipping ahead 10 seconds, to be really quite honest. <laughs> I think they would just be insulted by the term rest hold because, you know, it's like, I'm always working. Fuck resting. Yeah. I'm always working. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then they tell you the story about Johnny Valentine. Like, oh, his rest holds. He was working more than when he was actually moving, which not the case. So some of that old wrestling doesn't hold up. I'm just gonna I'm just going to be honest. Much like some music doesn't hold up. And it surprises me that there's even like a discussion on social media. They're like, oh, yeah, can we start talking about how the Beatles aren't that great? Like, that's something that's being said aloud by 20 year olds today. That is absurd. There's a thing going around on uh, film Twitter now where Almost Famous is a shitty movie. And it's not like a masterpiece, but people are just like, it's just a fucking horrible movie. Just every once in a while, there's always just a pocket of some little subgenre on Twitter that just thinks whatever has been esteemed for forever is now dog shit well you know what's not dog shit hopefully this episode this is a uh, 10 bell pod i am uh nick alexander i guess i am joined by michael j loving hey i'm here this is the thing we're doing and joined by the biggest party of them all i am very flamboyant unbelievable like wrestler with sunglasses on dressed like john <laughs> cena the man scout I can already tell that I have to carry this episode directly on my back. I have I have to pick up a weight the size of Buddy Landell late in his career and no. put it on my shoulder and carry it through. I'm, I'm going to have to come up with those witty one-liners that Buddy used to say all the time, like, uh, I don't give a crap about a cripple on a crack crutch. Like, that was always a good one, too. <laughs> my favorite one that, I, uh, that I'm going to use now on Nick when I beat him in a hand of poker is like, if I tell you it's Easter, you go home and paint your eggs. <laughs> And you tell all those pencil pushers to get out of my way, which is a Leonard Skinner lyric. Like I'm gonna, <laughs> like I was gonna incorporate a Jawbreaker lyric to a, a promo I'm gonna cut. And I'm like, man, I really shouldn't be doing this. And then I look back on all the territory promos; they're all just ripping off songs. Ric Flair, yeah. Blue, Jerry Lee Lewis. So uh, <laughs> get ready for obscure Matt Skiba and the voices and Jawbreaker references in all my promos going forward. That and obscure Tom Waits references as well. That's kind of what I'm on. All right. Today we are talking about the first person Goldberg ever beat on TV as part of his streak. He once pissed on John Denver's airplane. Yeah, and he did. Uh, he did a lot of other cool things that we'll get into, mostly Jake. It's, uh, it's Buddy Landell Day. I was really impressed that he once wrecked three rental cars in a single week. <laughs> Because as Jim Cornette put it, Buddy as a driver was the type of guy that needed to look at you when he was talking to you. Never a good sign. Never a good sign. So, you know, Buddy, we'll kind of get into why, but maybe not a name that everyone knows if you didn't grow up watching Crockett or whatever. Uh, explain Buddy Landell to people who may not know. Gosh, like this is this is going to sound derogatory. <laughs> And it's so not the case. If if, if we're just going to go, nobody knows anything about wrestling, you'd be like, he's the guy when you as a kid are like, Mom, Mom, can I get a Ric Flair? Like, no, you've got a Ric Flair at home. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> like, that's, yeah. that's a, I, I hate to put that on him, but like, and if you saw some of his work in Puerto Rico and other places, you know that's not the case. He's not a Ric Flair knockoff. But at the same time, too, like, he was kind of a Ric Flair knockoff in the same sense that Rick was like a Buddy Rogers knockoff. Yep. It's just that they're doing it at the same time. But the thing is, though, I would say that Casey James, who is developmental talent, was on SmackDown for a short period of time. He was copying Buddy Landell more than he was copying Ric Flair. And I would say that a lot of guys, when they do the Nature Boy thing, they're doing more Buddy Landell than they are Ric Flair. There's a, there's a sense of class, but there's a sense of low budgetness to buddy that gives him a bit of charm <laughs> but as we'll find out buddy was doing a lot of other smaller territories because of mistakes that he made but he had the opportunity to to break out from that and break out and to be bigger but you know he was always that you know poor man's version because he's doing this in memphis as opposed to jim crock promotions or new york and my contribution is yep what jake said I was going to save this for later, but do you think, in the long run, do you think the Nature Boy thing hurt him? 
because at first it was like, you know, it's cool. He rolled into Crockett and was like, I'm the nature boy. I'm taking your spot. But then like 10 years later, he's still doing it. And I think the casual fan is like, oh, who's this Ric Flair want to be? And he doesn't get like the, the meta-ness of it. Yeah, I, I'd have to say, because I remember when we did an interview with Ric Flair and we we discussed this very topic and he was just like, always talking about Buddy being this unbelievable wrestler in Puerto Rico. He said, because if you would have saw that 20 year old kid in Puerto Rico, if, if people would have just got to see that guy without the nature boy moniker, like he would have been one of the biggest stars of the industry if he could keep himself between the rails. So being a blonde professional wrestler that's flamboyant, you're obviously going to get compared to Ric Flair at all moments in time. And Buddy like idolized Ric Flair and wanted to be like Ric. So it just like Rick always wanted to be like Dusty Rhodes, but he realized he had to be a little bit different. But he just never made that conscious effort to be like, okay, well, I idolize this guy. I can follow this for about three years, but I have to differentiate me from Rick, which, you know, if he would have kept together in Crockett when he was going after Rick, maybe we, he would have made that leap but because he was never yeah. in the same place with Rick too much after that time. He was never forced to. So he's like... Oh, I'm the the Memphis version of Nature Boy Ric Flair. Oh, I'm Smoky Mountains version of the Nature Boy Ric Flair, or whatever. He could stay in that comfort zone and and be that and and do okay as long as he got to go go to the bar afterwards and have fun. All right, William Fritz Ensor was born August fourteenth, nineteen sixty one, in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we got a good one on this day. The same exact day, Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert was born. And Susan Olsen, who played Cindy on the Brady Bunch. So I don't know what you want to take from that, but that was a weird one to fucking find out. Well, I really wish Susan Olsen would have been Missy Hyatt as opposed to Missy Hyatt (laughs) for Eddie Gilbert. Anybody other than Missy Hyatt being Missy Hyatt's like a great idea. I love it. Yeah, even even Jan or even Alice. Alice would have been a better Missy Hyatt than Missy Hyatt. So (laughs) at least at least historically. I think I, I would like to believe that Alice from the Brady Bunch is on the right side of history. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a weird thing on Wikipedia. Obviously can't confirm this, but apparently his his fifth great grandfather, <laughs> Peter Scheip, worked for George Washington. This is total bullshit. There's no source. Okay. I, th- I think Buddy's Wikipedia, there's somebody who likes to have fun with it. Because I tried to do any more research, and you know if Buddy Landell was somehow tied to George Washington, that'd be in promos, that'd be in shoot interviews, that'd be all over the damn place. When I read it, I just kind of laughed, and then, yeah, it's gotta be bullshit. It's gotta be bullshit. Are you sure you've listened to everybody Landell's shoot interview? Because I, I feel like, as we're gonna, t- you know, sometimes with these episodes, sometimes our sole narrator is the, the guy who we're discussing, and sometimes they're the most unreliable narrator for their own life. And Buddy is most certainly one of those guys. There's a couple stories that I will put a disclaimer in front of that uh, <laughs> the only source I have on it is Buddy Landell, so I can't consider it as fact. That's why the whole the, the story being corroborated by J.J. Dillon later on is important, because I never really believed that story until I heard someone else tell it. So, And there's going to be a couple of those throughout. Sorry, Nick, did I cut you off before you really got to say it? But he was uh, like his fifth great grandfather was George Washington's baggage master or some yeah. shit. <laughs> I mean, it's, look it up on Wikipedia. It's it's bizarre. Vince would have had his ass in a powdered wig if he knew that. Right. <laughs> right. So Buddy was always a fan of wrestling and uh, growing up in Tennessee before wrestling was so streamlined into your home, he loved all the Tennessee guys. Uh, Macho Man was out there, Bob Roop, Robert Fuller, to name a few. Name a few and you're not going to name Ron Wright? Jeez, Nick. The Ah. king of Kingsport? Like if you are talking (laughs) about Eastern Tennessee wrestling and you don't bring up Ron Wright, who the fuck are you? I could I I could wrestle a show in Bristol, Tennessee. The look of the crowd and there'll be three hundred people there, and that's just good because the building only holds, you know, four hundred and they just crammed them in there even though we're in the middle of a pandemic and we really should be distancing and there really should only be about fifty people in here. But I digress. (laughs) 
always never fails. Every time I wrestle in Eastern Tennessee and somebody's got a decent house and the, they look out and I'm like, oh, this is a pretty good house. Noah, get us an extra 200, 300 people in here. <laughs> if we brought in Ron Wright. <laughs> Every single time. Not like, you know, we should bring in another name or somebody or Ring of Honor Town or get, get somebody like that. Like, no. We need Ron Wright. And I guarantee people still would say that and I'm pretty sure Ron has passed on. And people would say, you know, we need, we need to book Ron Wright to come in here. He, he He's such a goddamn legend in that area. that They speak his name in Eastern Tennessee. Now, you go to Cincinnati, Ohio, they have no fucking clue who he is. <laughs> but in Eastern Tennessee, to this day, Ron Wright's name it just is like Jerry the King Lawler in Memphis. Hands yeah, okay. down. Okay. That'd be a niche-ass episode for us to do. Oh, yeah, we're doing it. Well, we just did it right there. That's about all I know about Ron Wright. He had a great run in Smoky Mountain. He was in a wheelchair, pretended like he was crippled, and then he stood up one day and fucked the baby face over, and it was incredible. And he was... We'd have to get Les Thatcher in. Les Thatcher can do a whole four-hour episode on Ron Wright. I know there's going to come a day, and I got to be prepared to dedicate five hours to it, is I have to sit Les Thatcher down and be like, Grandpa, um... <laughs> Tell me about Ron Wright, and he will he will tell me everything I need to know about Ron Wright, and then I will have it. And then in the untimely, unfortunate time where we don't have Les Thatcher on this earth, all of that information will be in my head until 30 years later. Somebody goes, Grandpa, tell me about Ron Wright. <laughs> Landell was an amateur wrestler and played football in high school. I think he even had some offers to play in college, but he dropped out of school his junior year making up his mind that he was going to be a pro wrestler. A friend of his sister ran a camera down at uh, the local wrestling shows and ended up introducing him to Bob Orton and Bob Roop. Through that, he linked up with Boris Malenko, who was living in Memphis at the time, and after selling his car to pay for lessons, he started training in March of 1979. And I think the early years of Buddy's career, he talked about it on his, his shooter interview, is basically... He was broken in, much like a lot of guys get broken in. You set up and you tear down the ring, but, you know, and he'd hop in the ring truck, and then he'd even talk about how, like, he would get in the ring truck, drive to the town, set up and tear down the ring. He would referee a match. He'd come out later as a mass wrestler, or maybe do that twice later on because it's a small spot show. So he's wrestling twice on the show. He's referee in the other matches. He's setting up, he's tearing down the ring. And I think it was even, he even said he slept in the ring truck because he yeah. didn't have enough money to, to live anywhere. So like, just how hard is it? And he did, and he talked, he's like, oh, I did that for years, like three or four years or several years. It wasn't like, oh, I did that for about three months. And then all of a sudden I became the nature boy, Buddy Landell, and I was Puerto Rico. No, <laughs> he was doing that for like years, just surviving and absorbing pro wrestling every single day every second i mean it's seeping in through osmosis he is sleeping on the actual ring and whatever wrestling knowledge is on it is seeping into his bones while he sleeps boris kayfabed him the entire time and put him through a uh, very brutal workouts before he'd even teach him to lock up and this seems to be kind of like the magic number in wrestling. Did you have to do this, Jake? It's the uh, five miles, the 500 squats, usually Hindu squats, right? And then 500 push-ups. Is that like a, a, a rite of passage? During that time, yes. I've always heard that, that milestone, and I always tried to instill that. The first round of years that I did training at high spots, I, I never did the, like the 500 push-ups, but definitely like I had people doing a thousand Hindu squats before we ever took <laughs> a bump. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Vicky, we had uh, we had a girl. Her name is uh, Vicky Lyons, and if you've seen Mick Foley's like comedy special uh, that I believe is on the WWE Network, he talks about her. And if you've seen an episode, I believe of uh, I don't want to say Forensic Files, but one of those like true life crime stories. Basically, as a, as a very young child, she get hit by a car, and it was a hit. Oh. And and she had a lot of physical ailments, but she always wanted to be a professional wrestler. And she came to our wrestling school, and I did not give her a break at all. I made her do the thousand Hindu squats, and we worked our way up to it. And then people would come in new, and here's this girl who has physical disabilities ripping off a thousand Hindu squats <laughs> as these grown men who work out and have, like, you know, worked on chest day, bro, and back days. And here is this 
female who, who has spent most of her life handicapped is doing thousand Hindu squats while cursing out these these big bodybuilder guys saying <laughs> what's wrong <laughs> pussy like just like, just giving them the, the one four like her and me used to butt heads all the time but it, she was always great at talking shit to people while she's doing a thousand Hindu squats she was always great that way but yeah that was something that I tried to instill the first time around. Now I just don't have the time to dedicate that much time to <laughs> exercise. I, I just assume that you're going to walk in with the shape that you need so we can get to the training portion of it. But yeah, that was always a big thing. I've always heard that. All the old timers talk about that. That's what you had to do first because you have to make sure you're in shape for it. Because also too, you got to keep in mind, that's in an era where we don't have a gym on every corner, every block, every shopping mall, which we'll be back to that very soon. So don't worry because all the gyms are going to close because nobody can get in them. But I digress. Buddy's first match was in Johnson City, Tennessee, also home of The Hideaway and Atomic Comics. I love doing comedy there. Uh, around uh, October of 79, Buddy immediately got sucked into some wrestling drama when Southeastern Championship Wrestling split in half with some of them going to All-Star Wrestling. And they were like legit blood and crip feuding like with <laughs> guns and it was terrifying. Well, that's the Wild West days, you know, like uh, uh, if somebody ran your town, that's always like, I can't, he's running my town because there was a lot more money to fight over. That's what's so right. ridiculous about indie promoters now. They're like, he's running the, the Mooresville Armory. Doesn't he know that I run the, <laughs> the rec center up the street? He's going to go back to back weeks or even just like the North Carolina the indie scene, like the, the weird stuff of AML. Like, well, you know, these guys over here, they wrestle for AML. We can't use them over here. Even though we run Charlotte, they run Winston-Salem. And they're two totally different crowds because the Winston-Salem crowds suck, okay? Like, that's why. Sorry, that you just do. Because you sit on your hands, you don't care about nothing. I'm just, <laughs> oh, hot takes. I, I'm, sh hot takes right there. But the, <laughs> it's, that, it's that thing, too, of like, well, we're trying to present a similar product and we're in the same state. Shut up. Your clientele should be the world and yeah. streaming it out there. But... When you didn't have those things, when it was solely the town, when you were fighting over a thousand people that went to wrestling every week, yeah, that's a big, that, that's going to divide the audience. During that era, That there's a valid excuse. And yeah, go ahead and throw some guns and knives at each other <laughs> because that's some serious money because if those thousands are paying, you know, $5 a head on top of concessions and everything else, you could be getting anywhere from 5000 to $10,000 every week. And somebody's going to cut into that? Fuck you. I, I, I'd murder you. Be like, <laughs> it's like, that's how it is. But like indie promoters today trying to do that. We're fighting over who gets to lose money this week on this town. <laughs> that's all really it is. <laughs> who gets to lose money on a flight for Brian Cage? That's really all we're doing. Like who, <laughs> who's going to go, who's going to lose $500 when they, they buy a ticket for whoever else from the West Coast? Buddy's first kind of official job here would be in 1979 when he would go to Bill Watts Mid-South Wrestling, coming up against guys like Jake Roberts, Bob Orton Jr., and the Iron Sheet. Just needs to be pointed out this time, this is Black Hair Buddy. No blonde yet or anything. Old nickname Blackie. I don't know if that's true or not, but let's just go say it was. They called him Blackie. I don't We're know. Blackie Nick's over here. Nick might edit that out. Let's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know plenty of dudes like named Blackie, you know? Like, oh, trust digging me. the hole, digging the hole, digging <laughs> no, the hole. No, no, I'm, I'm, going, I'm jumping in. I'm, dig I'm digging <laughs> a hole like the Boner Yard match that I saw last night. Or I'm just digging a hole and saying all kinds of offensive stuff and then jumping in. Did you just go, it's cool, I have a friend named Blackie? <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. I, that. That is a bridge I'm not willing to cross, but you did. <laughs> I think it was also around this time where Buddy talks about he had his first blade job. And he was so proud of it that he walked into a 7-Eleven after the show, hadn't showered at all, still covered in blood, getting roller hot dogs and shit, everybody looking at him weird. But he was just so damn proud of that first blade job. I worked at a gas station one time. Trust me, I bet the attendants didn't even blink an eye. You see so yeah, much shit working at a gas station. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh, another guy covered in blood. Uh, like it's the uh. eighth one today. Yeah, like late night, like after a show, like sometimes as a wrestler, you just don't give a fuck about nothing. <laughs> right. And for the longest time, I stopped doing it because I, I could never keep the bill flat. And I've seen Sarge like so many, Sarge Slaughter so many times in the last two weeks. And I still forget <laughs> to ask him how he keeps the brim on his, you know, sergeant's hat so flat uh, because... <laughs> I would put it on the dashboard and then it would occur to the dashboard or I'd flip uh. it upside down and then it would bend to one side. So what I would do, especially on like, you know, where we're traveling from town to town and I got three bookings in a weekend, 
what I would do is I would put it on my head and I would wear it like in the car. And <laughs> then when I would go to the gas station, I'd forget to take it off. But the thing is, I'm not like dressed in full military regalia. I'm just wearing yeah. a Sergeant Slaughter hat with cut off <laughs> sleeves to an Alkaline Trio shirt in, in fucking cargo shorts <laughs> with flip flops. Just going about my day as if it's nothing, getting some cheer wine. But he would also get some work in Crockett, and there he'd work with Sarge, Ray Stevens, and the Ninja, who was Mr. Pogo from FMW, if you remember Holy our shit. Hayabusa episode. Really do want to recommend uh, checking out the Buddy versus Sergeant Slaughter match. It's on YouTube and the network. Good little, probably like five to seven minute match, but the added bonus is you get Rowdy Roddy Piper on commentary. And like uh, Micah brought up, this is a baby buddy, Landell, you know, he, far from the nature boy days. He has his dark hair. He's doing a ton of jobs. He's just kind of like a dude on the card. But all that would change in 1983 when he got his first big break when he was invited to Puerto Rico, where he had to dye his hair blonde and start working heel. Working six TV tapings back to back to back to back to back to back. I don't know if I got the back right there with the six, but yeah. Good Lord. Also keep in mind, too, like if he's, he's wrestling that much in Puerto Rico, he's kind of developing a, a new character. It's a great time, and, he, and he's getting a lot of reps in. Also, too, you know, we just mentioned he was in Mid-South, and you just list off the guys that were there. Mid-South, shitty fucking driving territory, but as far as educational during that time, the best right. you're going to get. Now, Crockett, you're obviously you're also going to learn, too, but a lot of people are established. You're going to be at the bottom of the card. So it's like, oh, okay, I've learned a bunch of Mid-South. I've got enough money. Now I'm going to go to Puerto Rico where the money could be a little sketch, but I'm going to get all the reps I need, and I'm going to develop a character that's away from the American scene, away from the magazines. So when I come back, I'll be something completely different. I'll be something fresh and new. And that's kind of the thing, too, that's it's difficult now, and I think it's always a problem that I have as the Man Scout. Like, I feel like if I would have debuted as the Man Scout, like if I just, like, didn't exist for the first 12 years of my career and then I popped up the last five like oh shit there's this guy man scout that people would go nuts for me because I'm new and I'm fresh and it's whatever but if you've been around a while as the same thing or you've been around as this they're like oh yeah I've heard him before oh yeah I've heard him like homicide yeah if someone like huh you can't tell me if homicide just a appeared five years ago that he wouldn't be just as over as some of the the guys that you see on gcw but now it's so long as a thing like oh yeah homicide's good yeah i've heard of homicide yeah homicide's a thing where it's like right. no you guys should get fucking excited by homicide cause it's <laughs> fucking incredible yeah. smoothest motherfucker in the ring and the, to quote eddie kingston that motherfucker built new york he's he's the best and still goes just as good as he did in his prime so while in Puerto Rico, he would win their North American title March 5th, 83, before dropping it to Pedro Morales in June. I thought it was also interesting just watching some buddy matches from Puerto Rico that he's booked as just this muscle monster powerhouse who his finisher for Buddy Landell was just a gorilla press slam and then flexing in the ring for the one, two, three. Also, Buddy would have the usual stories of running for his life from the crowds there, as especially as a hill. And um, years later, Buddy was actually in the hill locker room when Brody got killed. And he himself even brought up a time in 83 when Carlos Colon said that he would kill him if he didn't do, I think it was a finish. Yeah, I think so. After escaping with his uh, life off the island, Buddy went to work for Jerry Jarrett in Memphis. And this is kind of the start of the rise of Buddy Lando. Yeah, and see, that's the thing. Like, he, he disappeared, and he got all that experience, so he's got a couple years under his belt, and then he just kind of reappeared, which is, is something that you could only do in the territory days or you could do now. Because now guys, like, when they first come out the gate, they don't have two or three years under their belt. That's why some guys that wrestled on their just trunks, and then all of a sudden they went to a gimmick, they, and they didn't realize that they were that. Like, you look at like somebody like Officer Dan Barry. For the last three years, all of a sudden he starts doing the Officer Dan Barry thing when he was this high-flying guy in biker shorts. It, it freshens it up. It changes it up. It, di it does a different direction on everything. And that's basically kind of what uh, Buddy Landell had here. And also needs to be said, as Buddy said himself, right about this time is when he started doing the old cocaine. Yes, mostly because in 84, he would go to Mid-South, and we've brought it up more than once on this podcast, the epic drives, you gotta have something, Red Bull wasn't a thing yet. 
and the way he would talk about doing lines while driving, just the management of all that shit in your lap and driving. I mean, how do you, how do you not spill 80% of your cocaine all over your lap? <laughs> The names really start jumping up here as uh, Buddy's earning a higher spot on the card. He's tagging up with Butch Reed. He's having matches against the Rock and Roll Express, Magnum TA, Kerry Von Eric, and Steve Williams. The one thing that Buddy brought up that I thought was interesting that I hadn't really thought of is that, like, he said Bill Watts would be up front with you when you got to the territory. He'd be like, you're going to be mid-card for about eight months, get lots of experience, and then you'll head out. I hadn't really thought about that before, but... Just Jake, I guess it's kind of different nowadays, but do promoters kind of give you an idea right up front what they're going to do with you to that degree? Or is it just kind of like, hey, whatever? If they do, they're lying to you. Okay. <laughs> but uh, good ones just want to see where it, what happens. And right. the great ones see where it goes and then adjust their plans to where it ends up. There's not a lot of great ones. What they just usually end up doing is like, oh, this cool match versus this guy. Okay, or this guy's our, our our baby face guy that we feed guys to. Okay, he's got signed. Great, let's find somebody else real fast. And they don't think about who the next guy is or this guy or what they're doing. It's just like just have a bunch of cool matches, put on a show that lasts for four and a half hours, and go stream it. Bye. You know, like there's not that level of idea of like, hey, this guy's kind of our mid guy. This is this guy's always gonna be around. He's local. Right. Uh, he's gonna be that sets up for a champion or this guy's upcoming but he needs the wrestle good guys who will let really guys that are better than him so that's kind of what his matches on the card are going to be or it's like hey with the belt on this guy and we're just going to keep feeding people to this guy nobody ever thinks like that nobody has any concept it's just put on the coolest matches you know and i'm kind of for that especially if you have the roster for that but you got to decide what you are are you a storytelling promotion or are you just a promotion that puts on three and a half hour extravaganzas that you stream and you just want cool matches with gifts like just decide decide don't straddle the fence and try and do both because when you do that you're going to do both of them wrong decide what you want decide what your product's going to be what is the goal what is the impression that you want to put upon people that they're going to see when they watch it and they don't and for all of his flaws bill watts knew exactly what he wanted at all moments in time and being the guy that's sitting there with the, the budget ledger in front of him and towns and what everybody's doing and doing that all by hand and figuring it out, then yeah, he definitely should tell you exactly what he wants and he expects you to do what he wants because he has plans and there's this tremendous amount of pressure and luckily all those guys are extremely talented and they came up and delivered on that pressure. So yeah, that's why Mid-South was so great. And I remember Buddy showing me a promo that he took during that time and Jesus Christ, like, at, at no moment in time in, in, in Buddy's career would you ever say, like, man, I want to have a body like Buddy Landell, other than this one picture from Mid-South. He looks incredible. I'm sure it's online somewhere. Just look for the, the best-looking Buddy Landell 8x10 out there in the world. <laughs> yeah. That's from that Mid-South era. Like, he just, best shape of his life. The drugs hadn't and the parting hadn't got to him yet. He came back from Puerto Rico. He'd been working, probably getting in the gym a lot, probably hanging out with a lot of those guys that are lifting a lot mid-south and just getting to town early, getting that gym workout, then wrestling, and then taking off on an eight-hour drive to the next town. In February of 85, Buddy would head back to Crockett, and this is the run that's going to make him a star. Uh, he joined J.J. Dillon's stable, coming into Ric Flair's hometown claiming to be the nature boy and he's gonna get all the big names here but he was working against magnum dusty flair and george motherfucking south speaking of george south george told me a story about buddy that sticks with me to this day and i make jo i've made jokes about it on social media especially every time i fly it's my favorite story in the whole world and i and i quote it all the time during the time that like buddy's there crockett is exploding you know crockett has the plane I don't know if they have a couple of planes at this time, but they get the private jet because they're trying to double shot as much as possible. And there are a few times that someone like a George South was allowed on Crockett's plane <laughs> or like they'd be flying someplace and the whole crew is flying there. They charter an entire jet for the for the crew or whatever. And, you know, sometimes it's like, hey, we got to we got to leave at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. because we got an 11 o'clock show. So we got to get there early. And it's, it's quite a distance away. So, like, there was one flight that was leaving out at 5 a.m. So it's still dark outside. And, obviously, 5 a.m., if you're a partier, your thought process is. And it's, <laughs> I, when I was in the grips of substance abuse, I, uh, I 
subscribe to this where like, oh, it's leaving at 5 a.m. It's a flight. It's a long flight. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stay up and drink all night. I'm just going to stay up, party, do it, and just get completely fucked, get to the airport. And it's a charter, so I don't have to go through security or any of that shit. I just pull up, park, hop in the plane, and I'm fucking good. (laughs) Boom. So not all those guys subscribe to that, and you have a lot of guys that take this very seriously. And then you have people like Buddy that are just like, ah, it's a party, but not everybody feels that way. It's like everybody sees this a business, and this is what you should do. So somebody that comes back and is just that much of a wreck, you know, the eyeballs are on you. Like, this guy fucking stayed up all fucking night. We got fucking two shows a day. He hasn't fucking slept. How fucking dare he? That, that's the attitude that those guys would feel. And, of course, if you're under the substances, you feel that more than you would if you're sober, <laughs> those eyes leering upon you. And, of course, it doesn't help when Buddy gets on Crockett's plane at 5 a.m. when it's still dark wearing sunglasses. <laughs> Gives it away. And Gives it all away. there is a famous story where Buddy is walking onto the airplane with sunglasses on, basically still at night, fucked up, smelling like a fucking brewery, probably got some booger sugar hanging from his nose, <laughs> sits next to George because he doesn't want to sit next to like somebody like Tully who probably got a nice night of sleep, you know, or Dusty that kissed his kids goodbye before he got on his plane, or Ric Flair, who the biggest party of them all didn't even do that. But he sits next to George because, you know, George is going to be non judgmental. And then he leans over to George wearing sunglasses and then tips him down and whispers to George like, hey, George, you think they can tell I'm fucked up? <laughs> <laughs> and George is like, oh, no, they can't tell at all, buddy. You got them all fooled. You got them in. Nobody can tell. Nobody can tell. <laughs> So uh, every time I get on a, get on a plane, I always have sunglasses on, and I always think about that story. And I'm I'm waiting to lean over to a stranger and just be like, "Hey, <laughs> I think they can tell I'm fucked up." <laughs> and then on the reverse of that, anytime somebody's fucked up, I I pull the George South, where I like if I if somebody is clearly fucked up and they're tri- clearly trying to cover it up, I always walk over to him and be like, "Hey, man." They can't tell. Got this. <laughs> and, they, and they're like, obviously, like, I can see it. And they're like, they don't think anybody can see it, but I can see it. And then they start getting super paranoid. Oh, and shit. then you watch that unfurl. And that's my favorite thing. So just that story that George tells about Buddy during this time is pretty fucking remarkable. Also, too, another story of just how out of control Buddy was at this time. This is where really the wheels are, are coming off. Oh, yeah. This is this is a lot of things are happening, and I'm gonna not reveal the source of this story because I don't think he meant to say it and for it to be on a podcast. And I'm going to not include the other party involved in this, but they were bringing in a female valet to to Crockett, and this person was going to meet in the office with said wrestler who told me the story, to go over what they were going to do. They, they met in the office, they, they, they talked, and it was like later in the evening because it was kind of like she was flying in and they were going to go over it, yada, 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 yada. And of course, Crockett's office, wrestlers are coming in and out all day, getting their checks, getting their booking sheets, what, whatever, what have you. So this, this meeting happens, and this female valet sees this other wrestler, and this other wrestler sees this female, and they start talking. And this female wrestler just had a meeting about her being a part of an angle. And Buddy Landell basically sweet talks this female wrestler to having sex in the parking lot immediately after the meeting about her coming into Jim Crockett Promotions. Wow. (laughs) And said wrestler who was paired with this female was like, it's like goddamn fucking so and so. Like <laughs> she's been doing this shit forever. Cause he was he was complaining about because we were doing something with the both of them, and he was just like, she's been doing this shit since day one to me. Like because she was showing up late for an appearance, and so you might be able to figure that out from all the information. But I don't think it's uh, important for me to share some of the names because I don't want to shame anybody for having sex. If you want to fuck, go ahead and fuck, but maybe don't do that. Uh, in the parking lot of your business. That's just maybe like a, a bridge a little too far for me. But Buddy Landell, that much of a sweet talker that he can get that done. So on the build up to Starcade 85, Buddy would start feuding with Terry Taylor for the NWA National Heavyweight Championship. Two things that you really need to watch building up to Starcade 85 is go on YouTube and find Buddy Landell goes to Hollywood. 
you get to see J.J. Dillon and Buddy Landell in a living room watching flare tape, as in they're actually studying flare and trying to figure them out. Buddy just immediately blurts out, flare bores me. And then it turns into slow motion Cinemax softcore porn music as a sexy woman comes in and pours him a glass of champagne. They then go to a private bar where there is slow-mo dancing and laughing and J.J. Dillon being the most awkward fourth wheel in the history of time. And then you gotta look up the You're No Buddy Landell promo where J.J. Dillon builds up to it that he tells a story that so many daughters, so many young girls have have been passing out at the sight of Buddy Landell. So J.J. Dillon is given all the fathers watching the show time to get their daughters and move them to another room. And only then does he let Buddy Landell turn around so that he may grace everybody with his presence. It doesn't have to do with uh, Terry Taylor, but uh, I mean, you got to watch it to get an, a feel for Buddy at this time and how they were bringing him up. It was it was almost more Nature Boy than the Nature Boy in just the most ridiculous ways. J.J. Dillon is the original hide your kids, hide your wife guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They did that promo in Memphis with Michael Hayes. They put a towel over Michael Hayes's face. And they had Terry Gordy cut that promo, which is uh, weird because, like, you think Michael Hayes is the talker, but he's obviously the pretty one. Right. But Terry Gordy is like, I got this towel over over his head. <laughs> this is the most beautiful man in all the world. He's got fair falsehood hair. <laughs> and as soon as I take this towel off, if women are going to swoon. They're going to pass out. I'm going to give you more than enough time. And he went on and on. He went on for, like, a while. <laughs> Too long. And when he finally took the towel off of a young Michael Hayes, Hayes, I was like, yeah, this motherfucker is beautiful. Like, I was <laughs> like, 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 watch it. Like, that, that Michael Hayes, how good he fucking looked on camera. I get why Michael Hayes still thinks he's a sexy man, even to this day, because there was a time there wasn't anybody sexier than wrestling. But, uh, yeah, it, it's funny that Starcade 85, Buddy is wrestling Terry Taylor, because Terry Taylor, another nature boy knockoff guy. Yeah, right? that's right. It, it, so, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of weird that they put those guys together that, like we're trying to be flair or trying to be knockoff flares to an extent. I mean the the red trunks, the initials on yep. it, the robe, and and every. I mean just down to the T. Like both these guys are jacking over who's gonna be the next Ric Flair or the Ric Flair. You know, it's just it's it's interesting. It's very interesting. The Starcade '85 match is uh, pretty good. What'd you guys think of it? Man, the punches thrown and the punches taken and sold is just like a fucking plus. Just yes. The, 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 the intensity through it all and just man buddy landell's punch selling might be the like the fucking goat the way he would sell punches especially with his hair even better the flair the way he would whip it the way it would really look like he just got socked man it, it was gorgeous specifically in this match when they do like the pan outs he looks exactly like rick flair <laughs> it's freaky also, got to give it up to the ref in a full yellow suit with bell bottoms on. Got to give it up. <laughs> Lendell's manager, J.D. Dillon, uh, trips up Terry Taylor as he's going for a superplex, and this causes Landell to Landell on top of him. <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. You're fired from your job. <laughs> gets in. He gets the win. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, one thing around this time after, I think it's a couple weeks after Landell wins the belt, Look up uh, Buddy Landell versus Jeff Smith, 12785. In the realm of like the arrogant title holding heel winning a three minute squash match and being the biggest dick he can be, this match is a hundred out of a hundred. Buddy is talking shit the whole time. It's a small little TV studio match. Just like being mean, rubbing his face in, pretending to be nice and shake the dude's hand, but then immediately clobbering him that looks like a shoot punch. It is one of the best shitty heel dickhead Buddy Landell moments of everything I watched out of research. But yeah, Buddy Landell versus Jeff Smith, 12785. It's only, it'll only take four minutes out of your life, but it's good heel shit. So we have this young kid popped up on cocaine, big ego. He's chasing that nature boy gimmick, that nature boy lifestyle. And then he has the success to back it all up. Horrible. And this is a big recipe for disaster. And very soon buddy would throw it all away and this is i'll never forget meeting buddy landell it was at a mooresville national guard army show he was just doing an appearance 
Um, he was going to do a run in, was going to punch George South Jr. in a match. Like, George brought him in because like, it was back when, like, Buddy was, like, dipping his toe back into just, like, making appearances on the indie scene. And I think he might even have brown hair, like, he had his natural hair color and he was there in a track suit. But we also had Tracy Smothers there. And seeing Tracy and Buddy Landell go back and forth was, like, the most entertaining thing. <laughs> yeah, I learned so much about Buddy Landell. I learned so much about Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And Tracy was just like winding Buddy up. Like it's, it was better than any shoot interview, better than any TV show that I've ever fucking seen in my entire life. Just Tracy Smothers queuing up Buddy Landell, who hadn't been in a wrestling locker room in several years. <laughs> and Buddy just being buddies, spilling off all his fucking stories. And like Tracy asked the, the, the best fucking question. He goes, Buddy, how many times were you close to making a million dollars? And Buddy goes, there are two times that I was close to making a million dollars. The first one was uh, with Ric Flair and all of this. And over the years, this story has fascinated me because I am very particular about wrestling history. And I am very skeptical about what guys say in their own shoot interviews about themselves. And then I'm also skeptical about certain players and certain people that have things to say. So the story was always that Buddy... Because they did TV in Atlanta uh, early in the morning on Saturday. And the story goes that Buddy had too much fun Friday night and overslept the TV where they were going to shoot the fucking angle on TV where he goes against Flair and JJ is with Buddy and everybody turns on Flair. And like, because Flair was such a, even though he was a heel, he was regarded as a baby face and the crowds loved him in the Carolina. So they were going to make Buddy the heel and it was going to be Nature Boy versus Nature Boy. But they were going to take Flair out and Buddy was going to tell everybody, I'm your new Nature Boy. I'm your new Nature Boy. Because according to Buddy, Flair's wife had a miscarriage and he was supposed to be there for his wife. Now, from what I know about Ric Flair, Flair wouldn't be there for his wife. <laughs> just let you know. That's I'm just letting you know. I think already that, that if you're going to say that's why, I think that I call bullshit on Woo! that. So uh, that's... Just what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Ric Flair doesn't see to, to the ideal husband that would do something like that. He would do it for like a weekend and then go about his business. That's just, that's my opinion about Flair. You can have a different one if you want, and I, I will respect it. But my experiences of Rick, the man's a sociopath, <laughs> which made him one of the best professionals of all time. So if you want to be like, hey, he's one of the best professionals of all time, I'm not going to argue Michael that. Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, same thing. No doubt. So the validity of that and of course he got so drunk and they tried to call his room and he they couldn't get in touch with him so then dusty appeared on tv with the belt that buddy had and said i'm the new champ i won it and and and, and that's that's for sure and those are the things you can't prove is basically all of a sudden then buddy landell was gone he was no longer this champion and this angle didn't happen those are the things that we know for sure now black bart apparently was rooming with buddy or he was in the room over and he was called to go get buddy and he's talked about that story, but Black Bart's kind of a bullshitter too, but it does add to the credibility. It wasn't until I heard J.J. Dillon tell this story because he was the guy calling Buddy oh. in his room and was calling his room over and over and over again, <laughs> like, hey, you need to get the TV. We're doing this angle because obviously his – careers yeah, on the line too right? because he's going to be managing buddy like buddy get to the tv studio they're doing the fucking angle you're going to be working with flair in the fucking carolinas you're going to and you're going to tell everybody that you're the new nature boy oh, man. and fuck rick flair you're going to be at the fucking top you're going to make serious fucking money in the money territory of money territories <laughs> yeah! at this time like being on top and making ridiculous money in crockett you're going to be fucking set for fucking life and like He's he, JJ kept calling and calling and calling, and, and I think what happened, he ended up calling Black Bart, and that's the thing. But it wasn't until I heard JJ Dillon tell because JJ Dillon is long winded, he is accurate. I will, I will give him that. JJ Dillon has a very good memory, hence why he's so long winded because he tells you all the details. So yeah. when I heard JJ Dillon was the one calling Buddy to get him there, that's why I believe this is an actual correct story. And Buddy's even said that you know, he picked up the phone, like, fuck you, and hung up the phone. <laughs> It's, it's kind of part of the legend oh, of it all. God. The TV that was going to make his career forever. He just fucked it up. It would have been any other time. They could have let it slide and they would have made him. They, they might not have had as much trust in him, but they, they would have recognized the money they had and they would have pushed forward or they rethought or they had time. But just you could have fucked up the next week and you would have been fine because yeah. he would already been made. Like you could have waited a week to fuck up, but that's he didn't give a shit. And then also, too, like the other aspect of that. 
people fucking criticize Dusty for putting himself over so much, but when you're the booker and you've set up set the table, clearly you were talking about the promos, Michael, where they're they're getting ready to do Buddy Landell, Nature Boy versus Nature Boy, and Dusty, the booker, who probably gets a cut of all these houses that get drawn, is just salivating the fact that, see, baby, I told you, I told you, I am, the, I am the mind that I am the straw that stirs the drink. Not Reggie Jackson, no sir, no sir, the American dream. Ah, in the true genius. Just salivating at the fact to rub it in people's face that he's going to do this million dollar fucking angle. <sighs> and Buddy fucks it up. And so he puts a belt on himself and people will criticize it. But here's one thing's for sure Dusty's going to be there every week. Yep. He damn sure is going to fucking be there. Like he can't count on Buddy Landell. But he can't count on Buddy Landell, who has had all of the fucking cards, everything stacked up right in a row. All he has to do is fucking show up to the TV studio. And do this fucking angle. So if you're like in charge, you could just get frustrated. I'm like, I can't rely on anybody because it's because it's, it's not like, hey, I had to like rely on the Mulkies, you know what I'm saying? Or fucking somebody just coming in like, no, this was a guy that had everything. It wasn't somebody that like had been kind of treated like shit or disgruntled or whatever. Like, no, this guy had everything and you just had to show up. You know, it's not like relying on Billy Jack Haynes, who was a problem from day one. Yeah. No, it was like you had everything you worked, you did it, and it seems like everything was good, and then you fucked it up. What the fuck, man? Like, I can't trust you. So the only person I can trust is myself. And then and that develops over time, and then you do that when you, you really shouldn't, and you become paranoid upon people. I've seen it so many times in wrestling, and I think that that's an aspect of it, too. But, like... Yeah, I mean, Crockett was known for great fucking payoffs. And you're going to do an angle that's going to pop the fucking territory oh, like that? Because the crowd at that time, they wanted to cheer Rick. They wanted to cheer Rick. And the the, the struggle is we got to create a good heel. But, like, nobody was as good as a heel as Rick was. But if you take somebody who's doing the Nature Boy gimmick and insulting the fans like that, and as good as Buddy was, and you got JJ in his corner, that just fucking changes the whole fucking game. And then also, too, you think about creatively, too, it's like, you, all right, you go back to now Rick just being a heel and we're not acknowledging the fact that he's super fucking over as a baby face as opposed to capitalizing on what the fans want and then going that direction. Like I said about great bookers, and that's Dusty was a great booker and recognized this is the time to do this. The fans want him as a baby face. Let's make him a fucking baby face, even though Rick probably fucking hated it because he's not in control but against <laughs> something like buddy he might be able to give up that control so it's a shame we never got it yeah as buddy said he had fuck you money and when you're that young you think fuck you money is going to be around forever and that's just the pro it's, he said he had two houses four cars hundred thousand in the bank it's just like it's so frustrating you know when you get older it's like dude that's that's not the rest of your life what are you fucking yeah. doing man well, and also, too, at this time, George tells a story about Buddy Landell, where at this time when he's got all that money, he gets a gold chain, a gold chain that's got Buddy in gold <laughs> around his neck. <laughs> and, like, as the wheels are starting to fall off, Buddy told George, he goes, you see this chain right here that says Buddy? No matter what happens, I ain't ever selling this. And, and then that motherfucker went to Memphis, and he had to fucking sell this <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, like, that's... A little bit of a domino effect here. Apparently, Buddy's spot was given to Sting. Yeah, baby. After getting canned, uh, he said he went to Tennessee to dry out, and then they were like, oh, so that means you were trying to get better. And he was like, no, 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 I was still doing a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was still fucked up. <laughs> I was just making less yeah. money. Like, <laughs> even working Lawler on top. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? still, I am tagging with Bill Dundee against Lawler and Dutch Mantel, and I am making significantly less money. Like, I am in the best spot. Jerry Jarrett is involved in this fucking angle. <laughs> I have the two owners of the company involved in this fucking angle, and I'm making less money. How is that fucking possible? The, and this run in Memphis, it was when Buddy did another thing that kind of helped him stand out, something people still talk about today, the Bill and Buddy show. This is another one of those cases of Memphis being ahead of the curve. And people will talk about stuff that the NWO did, and they're like, oh, well, we did that in yeah, Memphis totally. years ago. and. Basically, the whole angle started Lance Russell, well-respected, probably one of the best wrestling commentators of all time, mostly because he knew 
just enough to communicate to the fans what's going on, but he knew less than than he should to make it a unique and interesting reaction to everything and so he could explain to the common person what's going on as accurately as possible to their communication because sometimes as wrestling commentators you get so inside that the common person doesn't understand what you're saying so that's why it's important to be relatable to everybody to the masses and and lance was great at that also too lance was great at being a straight man amidst all these wacky and crazy characters he was the barometer on how bad of a guy this is if guy did something like insult somebody's mother instead of you know like some like a wrestling commentator laughing oh that's a good your mama's joke or whatever Lance would be like come on be respectful <laughs> to women it's International Women's Day show him <laughs> some respect even though it's not International Women's Day he would put more gravity to the situation of what's going on uh, and make it more severe like and he'd always make it more severe than what it is he, uh, and heroics he he would trumpet it higher. It, it, dastardliness he would run them into the ground and very well respected he was the voice he was the barometer to everybody so when bill dundee fucking slapped him on tv oh. like any man he's just like you don't fucking slap me at work <laughs> and he's just like i refuse to talk to you so lance would always go over and talk to everybody no matter what they said but bill you laid your hands on me i'm not going to talk to you i'm not going to interview you bill go in the ring so they did that a couple times. Like, I'm not going to I'm not gonna interview. I'm not going to talk to you, Bill. You don't get any microphone time because you, you showed me disrespect. It, it, just like a, like, like a child. You know what I'm saying? Like, you showed me disrespect because that's the thing, too. Like, you see all these guys, like, these announcers getting beat up, and then, like, a, a week or two later, they're interviewing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? No, yeah, I right? refuse to be next to that guy. You know what I'm saying? Fuck him. So true. You know, just the, the whole that whole real-life thing of, like, no, fuck him. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't feel safe. I don't fucking feel safe at my job environment. I'm not going to go. That's a real fucking thing. So Bill Dundee is like, all right, fine, Lance. You don't want to talk to me? You don't have to. So they set up their own commentary desk and took it over. Do you don't want to talk to me? Go ahead and leave because we're doing the whole show now. And just taking over the idea of taking over the show and calling it the Bill and Buddy show. And then also, too, like you, like, I, like I alluded to earlier, the, the angles involving Bill Dundee and Buddy Landell having a tag match. And ve- a very young Jeff Jarrett is the referee. And everybody knows the name Jarrett. And, and they know Jerry Jarrett. He knows he's the promoter. And the the referee, obviously a young referee, doesn't know what he's doing. He's purposely put out there not knowing what he's doing. So he's not doing so they're getting hot at the referee, they're yelling and finally they just attack the referee. And it's like, whoa, whoa wait a minute, boy, wait, 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 wait a minute. They attack the referee and then Jerry comes in because it's a son, and the, the idea is that like the boss's son go out there and work, much like at a restaurant. Like you see, like the kid busting the tables. Like, you know, what if somebody just punched the little busboy who just happened <laughs> to be the owner's son? You know, that's basically what just fucking happened. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Dutch Mantel comes out. Jerry Lawler's already been gone because of a lose or leave town match with Bill Dundee, and. Jerry Jarrett, who's the owner, completely upset. There's a viable reason. I don't care what happened with Bill Dundee. We're bringing Jerry the King Lawler back from this lose leave town stipulation. You're in big trouble now. You shouldn't have done that. Well, guess what? I don't care what happened in this lose leave town. We're bringing back Jerry Lawler. So what a great angle. What a great thing to be looped into. But even with all this and as incredible this is the story, making probably a third of the money would have yeah. if he was wrestling Ric Flair. Probably a fifth. Probably a fifth of what he was going to make. But just still, even in his prime, he's incorporated in this amazing angle. All the promos in it are just incredible. But unfortunately, if you're trying to get sober, Memphis is the wrong place to go, to really quite honest. You, you can get just about anything you want at any moment in time. So Yeah, Buddy talks about how he has no memory at all of whatsoever of doing the Bill and Buddy show. He was so damn coked up. Be sure to go on YouTube and check it out, though. It's it's so good. Like Jake said, they set up their own booth. They go over to Lance Russell, and they take the script for the show, and they're reading through it like, oh, it says here we got to go to the Jerry Lawler video spot. Oh, we're not going to do that. And then you got the production guy coming out, and he's like, well, we have to do it. We're going to run anyway. All right, fine, do it. And then you get a tag match later in the show with them and the Bill and Buddy show, Lawler in a tag match, and they talk so much shit on commentary that Lawler gets pissed off in the middle of the match, and then him and Dutch Mantel walk out of the match for a count-out loss. And you're like, oh, shit, they got him. But then they enter on the other side of the studio with chairs ready to attack Buddy and Dundee, and they just beat the shit out of the set. It's so damn fun, man. I, I gotta look it up. The big blow-off match that uh, I want to see in its entirety, there is a Texas death match 
between Buddy and Bill Dundee versus Lawler and Dutch Mantel. There's clips of it on YouTube, which you can check out. I'm going to try to dig deep and find the whole thing. But, all right, tag match, Texas death match. It goes 48 minutes, 57 seconds. There are 26 falls. It sound, it, it's like ECW shit back even then. Jake was talking about them doing stuff before their time. This match is, th- even the clips are good. They're, they got metal stanchions as weapons. They're bringing tables and putting it on top of the wrestlers and like bouncing up and down and table surfing on them. There's some goofy ass fun hardcore spots. I just, I want to find that match in its entirety. Check that out on YouTube for sure. So following Memphis, he'd head back to Crockett in 86 for a much lesser spot with less responsibility. Then Buddy said they started messing with his money, so he quit. You know, he said, she said. But uh-huh. then he did go back to Watts territory where he was signed to a $200,000 contract. And that was the UWF. In 88, Buddy went to All Japan to work for Big Baba, facing the likes of Saruta, Kawada, and John Tenta. It's just weird seeing Buddy Landell in Japan, but uh, look up Buddy versus Yoshiaki Yatsu. It seems it's about a nine-minute low-key Sunday afternoon in Japan type match. But in this low-key Sunday afternoon nine-minute match, Buddy decides to blade. So Buddy's bleeding all over the place in Japan just because you know it's something to do. It, it, it seemed to sum up Buddy pretty good there. Well, I just thought I'd get colored. <laughs> I just was just a boy out there. I just thought I'd. I mean, red makes green out there. I mean, if we don't work hard on these Sunday in Japan, like I used to get sun- color all the time on Sunday on Crockett. <laughs> there is somebody getting color right now in Bristol, Tennessee. I promise you that much. So back in the States, Buddy would work the just decimated territory and indie scene in the uh, late 80s until 90 when he would get yet again another chance in the NWA, which was on the verge of becoming WCW. And Buddy would get him a fancy Superman movie theme ripoff entrance music, which I don't really get, but it's kind of funny. They try to rekindle the Ric Flair feud. It's not going to work as well as it would have years prior, but they have a battle of the Nature Boys, and they face each other November 24th, 1990. Buddy had really hoped that he was going to come back and be put on top, but that was absolutely not the case. Uh, he blamed a lot of it on the pizza man, Jim Hurd. Fucking Jim Hurd. Jim, Jim Hurd don't give a shit about Buddy Landale. Realizing that, you know, it was the new wave of body guys coming up. We're going to get all the spots. He adopted the fuck it, pin me, pay me, and just <laughs> hung out in WCW to get a steady check. He said he was getting 2100 a week, too, for just laying on his back, too, which yeah. fuck, man. He'd face uh, Flying Brian at the 1990 Great American Bash. I would say this, of all buddies, this run of WCW, check this one out the most. This was one of the first matches I watched when I was doing research, so that probably has something to do with it. But there's a lot of good little spots. Buddy selling the way, just little things that Buddy does really made me first see why he was so good and knew how to make the most out of small little moments. And then he would also meet Dustin Rhodes at Wrestle War 91. And you know, with all the beef between Buddy and Dusty, there's no way he's letting his son lose to Buddy here. Dusty's on commentary for this match. And at one point, he's talking about his son, Dustin. And Dusty says, I was never six foot six. As, as if it's like getting fat or growing a beard. Yeah, I just never did that six foot six. <laughs> Just wasn't worth the time because I was drawing so much money in Florida. I didn't have time to be six foot six. <laughs> Dustin wins with a bulldog, the move, not the animal. But Buddy's Aww. drug use and his attitude and apparently blowing snot on a hotel dance club manager would get him <laughs> fired uh, around March of 91. So he just fucking keeps blowing it, man. After ruining his career yet again, Buddy did some soul searching and actually got clean and motivated. And this would land him a spot in his good old pal Jim Cornette's promotion, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, 1992. You got to look up the promo that Buddy cuts to to get into Smoky Mountain. 215.92. It's on YouTube. It's just, your, it's kind of your basic, I'm a god around here. I'm coming to get everybody. Buddy's so fucking good on the mic. Just the way he can just get into it. And just, he's so impassioned, and man, watch this promo, it's good shit. Yeah, and Smoky Mountain is, it was just perfect for that particular geographical region. 
Like you couldn't have done that anywhere else. And the circumstances had to be just right because it was still kind of part of that Jim Crockett promotions. And once it became more WCW and everything there, and they were trying to compete with WWF at the time, like that old school wrestling feel was kind of taken out of it. And actually like in North Carolina, they tried to recreate that with uh, gosh what was it called it was like the swa it was that, that yeah we brought it up before that, yeah yeah that it, it escapes my mind right now but like shamrock was there nasty yeah. boys were there nelson royal was involved yeah. and uh, george scott i think was a booker for a while they had, uh, tonka wrestled for them they had a lot of guys like that but they never really like had the dedication to it or had the, the production people involved or the right people pushing it forward where Cornette was still very much kind of in the prime of his career. So he was very motivated to get Smoky Mountain going. And of course, Rick Rubin's money was probably helpful as well. So Smoky Mountain for that geographic region was just perfect because they felt like WCW was no longer the wrestling that they watched anymore. So that segment of the audience that got left behind, which I mean, heck, a lot of that segment of the audience still exists now, and that's why those NWA Legends Fans right. Fest were so successful, especially in this geographic area where they feel like they just lost the wrestling civil war, which could start a whole political conversation about like people in this area still have got over the civil war as well. But <laughs> I digress. I will only talk about what I know. There are still some people that are mad that they lost the wrestling civil war. It was about territories rights. <laughs> there you go. That's a t-shirt. So, Buddy does have a pretty epic run in Smoky Mountain, but this ain't it. He almost immediately dips over heat with Tim Horner getting the belt put on him. Who doesn't <laughs> hate Tim Horner? I, he, every, it seems like every time we dive back into one of these old school guys, everyone has a story about how they hate Tim Horner. There's even a shoot with Tim Horner's mom, and she's like, mm, don't care for him. <laughs> I mean, I've told you my Tim yes. Horner story. We don't have to fucking, I'm not, yes. So you've heard, the, my mind's been put on the record. And Cornette doesn't like Tim Horner, but at the same time too, Tim Horner, he was an integral part to Smoky Mountain. Mm -hmm. I think he owned the company that printed the t-shirts and a lot of the merchandise. Like, cause he had those lightning bolts cause he was white lightning. <laughs> like he had a company that made those actual <laughs> lightning bolts and a lot of the merchandise was created through there. And then also like he had space for some of the offices. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if like, wherever this warehouse was where they stored the ring like i i'm sure he was so integral to smoky mountain in some of the operation stuff you couldn't get rid of him and that probably pissed off a lot of people and just about everybody came through smoky at some moment in time for everybody to get an idea please listen to jim Cornette's epic takedown of tim horner where it basically goes on for 30 minutes and it's pretty classic Cornette. Yeah, and I hate to agree with Cornette on just about anything <laughs> other than like anything, especially anything wrestling related. I would love to argue every every point, but yeah, I agree a thousand percent. Fuck Tim <laughs> like, like that may be the thing that bonds me and old JC. I don't know. <laughs> and as the story goes, that Buddy got fired from his first run. Him and Mr. Tim Horner, they were in an I Quit match, and at some point during this, when Tim Horner put the microphone up to Buddy Landell to ask him if he quits. Buddy takes a beat, takes a deep breath, and then sings, Moon River! Apparently pissing off Cornette, he had to go back on production videos and edit it out for right shit. Buddy singing Moon River during an I Quit match is what got him fired from his first run. <laughs> so Buddy would spend 93 and 94 in the USWA, even picking up their heavyweight title from Jeff Jarrett. And then in 94, he would come back to Smoky Mountain, this time for a real run, and he would come in swinging, taking the TV title off of Brian Lee. He'd have a match with George South. He'd feud with Dirty White Boy, Steve and Brad Armstrong over the strap. And then he would have a very special match with WWF Intercontinental Champion, the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels, setting a record house at Knoxville Coliseum. Sold it out, baby. Well, let me tell you how that fucking happened. <laughs> and you guys already fucking know, and I'm sure you guys have watched it. So obviously you're like, all right, Shawn Michaels wrestling on a Smoky Mountain show in 95 for the IC title. You're like, how did that happen? Well, just for those of you who didn't know that happened, Smoky Mountain had a very good working relationship with WWF. There's multiple podcasts that lay that all out and why that is. You know, The Undertaker came in and wrestled the Unabomber, Glenn Jacobs, and that was the thing that got him his job eventually. So there's a lot of that going on. And obviously bringing Shawn Michaels in, 
Shawn Michaels in 95, too. Like, prime the, fucking the Shawn fucking Michaels. Man. This is the man. Like, and, and they could have just sold it out just on its own or, got, or had a good house. But I think the thing that was kind of the tipping point for that show, that's like, I can't miss this show. And I'll explain to you the power of it, is the promo that Buddy cut leading into that Shawn Michaels yeah. match is such a fucking work of art. It starts out with Cornette in uh, military fatigue because the whole Armstrong Army <laughs> thing's so going stupid. on at that time. And he does the stereotypical, make sure you be there, Knoxville, Tennessee, Oxford, uh, uh, and it just, you know, like, data and information. And, like, he just kicks it over to Buddy to do just the, the regular old fucking wrestling interview. I'm going to beat you, Shawn Michaels. You call yourself a sexy boy. Well, I've been the sexy boy since 1985. And you're expecting this very typical wrestling promo that you've seen a million times in every territory on the planet and for whatever reason on this day buddies pulled at your fucking heartstrings and talked about how like you know what i said i've been from a lot of different places but in reality i grew up in knoxville tennessee if you couldn't tell on my thick tennessee accent and then goes on to talk about all his alcohol abuse and all the troubles and he goes i was supposed to be at the top but i'm not at the top this is where i'm at right now and almost kind of give you that thought that maybe Maybe this is my opportunity to the top. Maybe if I beat Shawn Michaels and I become the Intercontinental Champion, this is my, my chance to the top because I was good enough to be at the top of one moment in time, and everybody knows that. You know that. You, the wrestling fans. And the wrestling fans that do know that, they're like, yeah, he was. He was very close. And then, like, you're like, holy shit, like, this is, this is real. And, and anytime that you can pull that, that, that curtain back just enough, they're like, I think this is real. No, this is real. This is real. I don't know if this match is going to be real, but this is real. Well, if this is real, is something in the match going to be real? It, it's it's much like with, with CM Punk and all the things that he said, like like in the pipe bomb and the other promos we talk about. Like, holy shit, CM Punk said New Japan <laughs> on, on WWE TV? Like, that's a real thing. Like, the, the WWE universe is supposed to be closed off to everything else, but you're acknowledging something else that happened before? Whoa, wait a minute. What's going, what's going on? What is he saying? What's he talking about? Like, and it's, it, it, it disorients you, you know, like you're, you're, you're kind of like discombobulated a little bit and it kind of throws you off. And when you're like that, it, it creates doubt. And like Tully Blanchard always says, you need 5% doubt. Well, that's exactly what Buddy's creating and, and creating this idea that, you know, this could be my opportunity to get back to the top. You know how good I am. It did such a great job of suspending that disbelief that the owner of High Spots, Michael Bacchicchio, who is a Smoky Mountain wrestling fan, a tape trader this time, this is when he's in law school at Wake Forest in Winston-Salem. He saw this promo and had planned to do something else the day of that show. He wasn't going to go to that Smoky Mountain show. He would go to Smoky Mountain shows of like Asheville or wherever, but he saw this promo that Buddy cut and Michael, the owner of High Spots, who claims to not be a wrestling fan and tries to deny he's not a wrestling fan, but he was a wrestling fan. Huh. He saw this promo and was like, I have to drop everything. <laughs> I, ha I have to go see this match with Buddy Landell. I have to drive from Winston-Salem to Knoxville, Tennessee to see this match where Buddy Landell wrestles Shawn Michaels because I believe there might be a possibility that he could win the Intercontinental title. Michael talks about this promo being a thing that got him in the car and drove hours to see this match. And that is what professional wrestling is supposed to do, is supposed to create a call to action to get fans from their homes to the arena to see it live because they want to experience that moment. That's what pro wrestling is. That's why I fucking hate empty arena shows because that's yeah. what pro wrestling is, is to get people a call to action that you're so drawn to it. You have to fucking be close to it. You have to be in the same fucking airspace as this fucking event that you want to fucking see. That's what pro wrestling is supposed to do. And that's exactly what Buddy Landell did for Michael Bikikio as the owner of it. Much in the same sense what we detailed in a bonus episode about what CM Punk did to me. That's exactly that exact feeling Buddy Landell created for that match and created for a lot of people. So I'm sure they would have had one heck of a house. But the thing that made it sold out was this promo by Buddy. When you have someone of the star power of Shawn Michaels and then you have a piece of promotion that is as good as this guaranteed sell out every time. It doesn't get any better than that. What are your thoughts on the actual match here? Man, it's good. I, the way they're chanting buddy, buddy before he even comes out to the ring, just the vibe from that 
it makes it all pretty damn special. <laughs> One of my favorite parts, the announcer actually does the, let's get ready to rumble. And you got that combined with the Super Bowl of Wrestling. It was like, I was like, is Cornette going to have fucking Mickey Mouse out here as a special guest referee? He was like trying to pile lawsuit on top of lawsuit. He had a Ninja Turtle as <laughs> a special yeah. timekeeper, though. So, you know, this is prime Shawn Michaels diva. But Shawn, like, lets Buddy get all his shit. Like, he makes Buddy look good. Buddy's going to go on to lose here. But man, Shawn, like, gets one of those put the other guy over wins. And as Buddy told him, like, Sean told him, he's like, you call it out there, you're the man. Yeah, Buddy is very appreciative to Sean, called him the goat in ring, and I was like, oh, this is why Jake wanted to cover him. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm, that's right. We just got to get another another piece of the defense, but that's just, Sean, Sean knows. <laughs> like, Sean knows how good Buddy yeah. is. As, as much of a mark as Sean was for Ric Flair, like, you have to know about Buddy Landell and then the times through Mid-South yep. and... Sean growing up in that area, like he's he's been aware of someone like Buddy Landell for a while, and just I, I'm sure Sean was excited to wrestle somebody like Buddy Landell. It's probably why he was like, "Oh yeah, give me that guy. I get to wrestle Buddy Landell." I mean, I'm not gonna r- wrestle anybody like that here. It's just like kind of like when people tell me when I get to the arena, like, "Hey, you're wrestling Hacksaw Jim Duggan." I'm wrestling Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Awesome, cool. I remember watching him growing yeah. up, it's, as opposed to you're wrestling Jason the Crazy Boy Kid. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like. Oh, I'm gonna like make this guy look good, and I'm gonna get out of here. Now, granted, usually it's like, oh, I'm gonna lose the hacksaw. Fine, great. He, I should lose the hacksaw. But like the idea of like getting to wrestle somebody like that that you've heard of and been around with. I mean, the thing that the dream match for me is wrestling Christopher Daniels, or it was always Brad Armstrong. Like, I know this guy's a great fucking worker, and like, fuck yeah. And then I think I think like Sean probably sensed that, and with Buddy being clean and sober, is like, man, because there's always that thing of like, man, if Buddy was ever clean and sober, he was one of the best. I'm sure Sean's like, man, I like, he's clean and sober, let's see what the fuck we can do. And also, too, Sean Michaels wants to prove everybody, like, I just had a great fucking match with Buddy Landell and fucking Knox. <laughs> fuck you. Can you <laughs> yep. do that, Brett? No, you would have fucking did your same-ass fucking comeback, Brett, and you wouldn't have created the fucking emotion we did. I would say, if you do want to watch this match, do go back. There is a when Sean was just starting out, man, 1984 Mid-South, Buddy versus Sean. Sean's wearing a red MTV shirt looking like 12-year-old Shawn Michaels. You get to see them work then and Buddy go over in that match, and then you get to see them turn into what they are now and kind of things have turned around for each of them in different ways. But it's, it's, it'd be a cool double feature to watch those two matches back to back. So after Rick Rubin lost all his money that he was willing to lose and the mummy went off to star in Hollywood's Brandon Fraser franchise, uh, Smoky Mountain closed down. Corny headed to WWF and decided to bring Buddy Landell with him and Buddy would start working December 5th, 95, the exact same day as Stone Cold. While in WWF, he'd keep up the whole Ric Flair shtick, uh, even using a version of his entrance music. Well, the match where he wrestled Ahmed on pay-per-view... Do you want to know why that came about? Yes. It's because Jeff felt that Ahmed was unsafe and he didn't want to work with him. And so Buddy, with that pin me, pay me attitude, which hindered him in WCW and probably devalued him, and he probably should have fought for a better spot or he should have like really gone after a better spot, that pin me, pay me attitude was the thing that got him on pay-per-view, which got him to have a decent match like, hey, this guy's dependable, which Vince probably hadn't had any dealings with Buddy Landell and Buddy to step up and go, I'll job to Ahmed on pay-per-view. <laughs> like, you know what, sir? You are a dependable individual. You're the most dependable person that I've ever met in my entire life. And everybody's like, Vince, you know you're talking <laughs> about. You're the most undependable person in professional wrestling. And, and, of course, that led to a lot of matches. Of course, you know, he wrestled Bob Holly, who did his tour in Smoky Mountain. So I'm sure Cornette was like, Bob Holly and Buddy Landell, they got two Smoky Mountain guys. See, Vince, I told you, Smoky Mountain's a place where you're, you're, you know, probably went on and on and gushed about Smoky Mountain and how it produces great talent for him. And then, of course, you know, he went on to beat Matt Hardy. In the shoot interview, he was like, I beat the shit out of that Hardy boy. And if I you watch that match, he did beat the shit out of that Hardy boy. <laughs> You know what? I, I wish I would have. We would done this episode before we did the virtual gimmick table. I would have. I, I would have talked to that about Matt. And I just <laughs> got been... to talking about that with Matt because my virtual gimmick table episode with Matt did not turn out to be what I wanted it to be. So I apologize to anybody who saw that because I had much better plans, but I just turned into a guy that was holding uh, Funkos. But whatever. Buddy did get a, a title shot with Bret Hart, and Buddy in that meeting in the Mooresville Armory with Buddy and Tracy that I talked about. Buddy talked about that. 
and like you know buddy kind of be getting steam and they're kind of thinking about doing something with him but they weren't for sure but they're like well let's give him brett but ah, uh, you know brett's a chant you know we want brett to like go over strong with the sharpshooters but like let's take an opportunity to like have Buddy Landell versus Bret Hart, but he's got to go over the sharpshooter. And they didn't know how to approach someone like Buddy, who's been wrestling as long as he has, and they know that he might have a little bit of kickback on it. So Buddy told the story. Is they basically, you know, they were apprehensive about telling him that he was gonna tap out to the sharpshooter. So they go to Buddy and they kind of dance around the issue, and they're just like, "Well, we we're kind of thinking about maybe um, uh, you uh, the finish. Uh, he gets you in the sharpshooter and you tap out." And they just kind of say it real fast. And they're waiting for Buddy to get the kickback and give that Buddy Landell attitude. And Buddy sensed that. And Buddy goes, hold on, what? You want me to tap out to the sharpshooter? All right. I'm going to tap out to the sharpshooter under one condition. That it happens in the middle of the <laughs> ring. That's all I want. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like you just, and they're like, oh, okay, that's okay. Right, and right. that's when they're like, oh, man. Buddy Landell, I knew he was the pen- most dependable man in professional wrestling right here. He's willing to do a job right in the middle of the ring. <laughs> I'll do that, and that's something that I, I joke around with, too. So when I work with a promoter the first time, and they're a little apprehensive, like, hey, do you think you got a problem putting this guy over? Under one condition. Oh. As long as it happens in the middle of the fucking nah. ring. That's all I care about. But that's something I got from, from Buddy. Jake, if you want another feather in your cap, Shawn Michaels, Buddy Landell match, much better than the Bret Hart one. So there you go. Yeah, I bet. And a, a cool thing they were doing through all these matches he had is they kept bringing up, this is a 17-year veteran who, who finally made it to the WWF. So they seemed like they were going to make a storyline out of this guy who like just fought and fought and made it to the top. I mean, they could have gave him like an IC belt, a t- you know, they, they were clearly thinking of doing something with them because there was a through line in all of his matches. But sadly, that would not happen for Buddy. And this time it wasn't his fault. Vince was prepared to sign him to a two year, $150,000 a year contract, but he wouldn't go into the details. And I don't know the details, but apparently Buddy slipped and fell at the Hilton and tore his quad. From what I gathered, or maybe Jake probably heard more than me, but the thing that I heard is that there was a automatic door going to the outside of the hotel, and it was all slick and icy. Buddy maybe didn't take the most precaution, slip, busted the shit out of his ass. And then the reason he doesn't talk about that on the shoot is because he was in the middle of, which eventually turned into a big lawsuit settlement with, with the hotel. But to back up for a second, the whole through line of a 17-year vet, well, guess what, guys? This is my 17th year oh, in the shit. business. So that idea of this guy's been around for 17 years and it's never got a break and never got a shot. Um, you could tell that story again <laughs> if you want, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm right here. I've, I've had drug and al- alcohol uh, issues. I think I've even cut that version of that promo before in inspiration from Buddy Landell. So if you're looking to repeat that... Um, uh, now I'm a little more jacked than Buddy was during uh, this WWF run as I do this recording with my shirt off. So you guys can tell it and you know it. But Jake will even jobbed modern day Ahmed Johnson even now. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah, modern day Ahmed Johnson. I will take. I will happily take the pearl over p- plunge. And a matter of fact, like the way that Shawn Michaels felt about Buddy Landell, that's how I feel about Ahmed Johnson. I walk up to Ahmed like. You're calling it tonight. Which would be the biggest mistake of my time. You're dead. You're a dead man. Which I'm pretty sure you'd say kick wham pro river plunge, and I'd be fine with that. That's fine with me. That's fine with me. But to paint a maybe like kind of a conspiracy theory angle to all this, this is a, a, the the second time that Buddy said that he was destined to make a million dollars. The first was with Flair and Crockett. The first time. The second time was with WWF. He could have had an opportunity. Um, they detail what the, the contract would have been, but if they would have had some merchandise and he would have got roll and he could have made a million dollars very easily. And if he would have stuck around for a few years for the Attitude Era and got a couple of those house show paydays, even when things weren't all that great, merchandise wise, he would have done all right. But what I always heard, because I heard different stories that he slipped outside of the hotel. I heard he slipped in a bathtub. All I know is he slipped. I've heard a couple <laughs> different yeah. stories. But something I, I heard that, that paints it a little bit differently, it wasn't so much the injury that got him fired. It was the fact that he sued. Oh. They saw, they, they saw right. and, and, it was kind of, and from what I hear, it was just kind of a slip, and, it's, and a lot of people thought that Buddy was kind of milking the injury because he saw an opportunity to sue a hotel chain 
So people in the WWF were like, oh, if he gets uh, hurt in the ring, is he going to end up suing us? Interesting. Because they felt like, okay, you took, a, you slipped and you fell and you could have just walked it off, but you're seeing it as an opportunity to capitalize on Hilton being this multi-billion dollar corporation and trying to sue them. I think that that was the thing that kind of got WWF their hands off. Like, oh, you're taking an opportunity to do this. So they didn't really believe the the seriousness of his injury. They just saw him as trying to get a payday. A pro wrestler getting injured on your property is a nightmare because you know he's going to sell the shit out of it. He's going to show up in court in like a neck brace, even though it doesn't make sense. He's going <laughs> to cut like a hard times promo. He has all the tools to fuck you up in court. Well, here's the thing. There, there was a pro wrestler in North Carolina that did that. He slipped and <laughs> fell in a McDonald's. Because they had some 17-year-old forget to put out right. the caution uh, floor is wet thing. He slipped and fell, took a big old bump, <laughs> and they got footage of it, and the guy went to court. But George South went to court because the guy didn't ex- disclose he was a pro wrestler. George went to court and said, no, nah, no, nah, that guy's a pro wrestler. He didn't bump just fine. <laughs> and basically fucked this guy over because he, did, he didn't like him or because he fucked him <laughs> over hilarious. on a rental. Like George fucked him over because of some petty indie beef. And this guy was about ready to make millions of dollars from McDonald's. Like, he, this amazing. guy would have made more than anybody that played Monopoly in McDonald's during the 90s. This run in uh, WWF is kind of Buddy's last big swing at the spotlight. But in 96, he was in a movie, Box of Moonlight, Micah? Dude, I, when I was watching the shoot, I totally... I, I've seen Box of Moonlight before. John Turturro, Sam Rockwell. It's it's a, the best of kind of 90s indie flicks. But man, I, I didn't remember this. But when he brought it up, I totally fucking marked out. Especially because Buddy's like, it's funny as hell. It's a great movie. It really is. I went back and watched it last night. It's a scene where Sam Rockwell pay, plays this kind of off the beaten path, living out in the woods, man of the earth dude. And he's watching wrestling with John Turturro, who's the straight laced guy who, you know, Sam Rockwell kind of shows that there's more to life type shit. And they're watching wrestling and Sam Rockwell's a total fucking mark. And he's watching this match where Buddy Landell plays Uncle Sam, son, because of his hair. And he's dressed all in like uh, Ultimate Warrior red, white, and blue tassels and shit. And there's, it's just a short little scene of just Sam Rockwell watching him on TV. But it was so cool to see. And Sam Rockwell's a hell of a mark. Good movie. Cool to see Buddy in it. Check it out if you can. Around this time, he would get a job as a reserve police officer. I did not even know that was a thing. Uh, he'd focus more on his home life, raising his kids, making up his wrestling career to his wife of 34 years. But Buddy wouldn't stop wrestling. He worked across the country in uh, independent promotions, usually hanging out in Jake Manning's neck of the woods, the Northeast, the Southeast, dipping over to the Midwest. He uh, he had a run in Ozark Mountain Wrestling, which I forgot which is a thing, which is on High Spots Network. There's a good, it's stars of Ozark Mountain Wrestling, and there's a chunk, I think it's like 20 minutes of Buddy, and it's some good shit. He was feuding with Cactus Jack back then, so you get dueling uh, Foley, Buddy Landell promos, which is fucking gold. But there's all types of, there's good stuff there. I, I didn't, do you know much about Ozark, Jake? That's how Burt Prentice started that, because he had a, a money man in Jonesboro, Arkansas that, uh, was able to get them on TV, get them on a sponsorship. So basically, Burt could just walk into the building, produce some wrestling, put it on TV, and they just had just money coming in from sponsorship because it wasn't from the gates. I mean, like they had like 150 people in the audience, but they had so many sponsorships on the TV show, it paid for fucking wow. everything. So they basically like lived there, and then they had enough. Somebody gave them a building for a while, so then they had to pay rent. It was it was a good little it was a good little scam, but everything in pro wrestling is a scam. So one of the highlights, real quick, uh, Buddy Landell cuts a promo, and it must have been right around the time that the mask with Jim Carrey come out, because Buddy ends his promo with "Somebody stop me!" Stealing again from all forms <laughs> exactly, of media. Exactly. Coming, just wait for the day that I start quoting Jawbreaker <laughs> lyrics in the middle of my promos. Which you, you you say that you know Buddy Landell is doing the indie circuit in my neck of the woods. Well, believe it or not, I tagged oh, with Buddy shit. Landell. Oh shit! What? Bet you guys didn't fucking <laughs> I, did, I that missed that one. Research Is that on Cage Match. I was in a fucking like it was either a six or eight man tag team match. I can't. Remember. I want to say eight because I feel like there was too many people on the apron when I was in the ring, and I was on the heel side with Buddy, and uh, I'll never forget it. And like Buddy. 
I'd seen him at conventions all the time. And like I said, I've chronicled that story where he showed up the Mooresville Armory. And you say all different types of jobs. I remember when I met him, he said he was a day trader online. <laughs> <laughs> like, every time I saw him, he had a different weird job or he was on something. He was one of those guys, like, he'd be like, hey, you know, I just started doing CrossFit. Let right, me tell you about yeah. CrossFit. Or like, hey, I just turned vegan. Let me tell you about me being vegan. Well, he, and I hate, I, I hate to discredit this because I, I don't want to belittle anybody with this because uh, I myself, I identify myself as a Christian, even though I believe that a woman should have the right to choose whatever she wants to do with her body. And I also believe that members of the LBGTQ community are not going to hell because of who they love. But I guess because of those two things, that makes me not Christian. So whatever. That's side of the point. Um, buddy found Christianity towards the end of his life. And much like most people that get into CrossFit, he wanted to tell everybody about it. And <laughs> anytime you knew Buddy was in the room, he was always talking the loudest. And if it's something new going on, like when he was a day trader, he was talking all about stocks. <laughs> but now he's, now he's into Christianity. And they're in this like six or eight man tag. There was a guy who was wearing red pleather pants, a white t-shirt, and basically a Rey Mysterio mask and was calling himself the Crossed Warrior wow. or something like that. This is also like the same show where Iron Cross is on the show. I think Iron Cross might have even been in the tag Jesus. team match too. He was, he basically, and Iron Cross basically had a Mil Mascaris hood, which basically just had a cross in the middle. Which, you know, wrestlers and Christianity, it's fine. And this wasn't even a church show. This was at a school in West Virginia somewhere, <laughs> or Southwest Virginia. Up in coal mining country, old Smoky Mountain territory. I used to wrestle in the, those areas a lot. And um, it was just going to be this tag match. It was a Stan Lee show. Um, Stan the Man Lee, who's based out of like you know Bristol, Tennessee, up, up in that Ron Wright territory, to to make it simple for everybody. And you know a lot of those matches we can kind of call in the ring, feel it out there, have a couple spots, but like we need to probably call most of it out there to just kind of get a flow for the crowd. And it's a lot of playing around with the crowd, so you don't want to do too many spots. And I just Buddy kept going on and on and on about like the Lord this and the Bible says this and the Bible says that and he's just being very loud and just talking about Jesus <laughs> Jesus 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 which I'm not a fan of because like I said I'm a Christian and I know the there's a, a Bible passage that says the man who falls to his feet in the middle of the street and praises my name does not love me any more than the man who secretly privately in the shadows. Praises Amen. Me. And that's, that's how I feel about Christianity and people that proclaim that how much they love Jesus on a public forum. So his buddy is just like Jesus and talking to this, like, mass all of the two christian guys that have crosses on there because ray mysterio's hood has a cross on him because well i just picked a ray mysterio replica hood because i believe in jesus like, well, why don't you just get a different mask that's kind of like ray like fuck it iron cross took a mil mascara's hood and just put a cross on it but you're just you're just wearing something you get from wwe shop com like uh, whatever and I, sure i'll take your her karana that'll look like shit <laughs> whatever because i basically like it was like Buddy Landell and and a couple other people that weren't willing to bump. So I'm the heel and I'm taking I'm taking the comeback. I'm doing all the bumps and like obviously I just want kind of Buddy to get a nice payday because I love Buddy Landell. Um, I did a couple of things here and there. I did my spot where I grabbed the guy for a suplex. I taunt the baby face in the apron, like kind of spit in his direction. The baby face comes in. Ref goes to him. The baby face is in the ring with me, gives me a small package. We're sitting there for one, two, three, four, five. Like wow. getting a clear count while the referee's yeah. back turn, trying to hold get, break that. And the thing is, the way that I do it, when the guy kicks out, my back is to the baby face apron. He's in my neck of the wood, so he's got to get through me to get to his partner. <laughs> and when he gets back up, I just close in the shit out nice. of him. So not only does he get fucked out of possibly getting in a three count, I have now positioned myself properly that he's got to get through me again, which is the whole thing of trying to work your way over to your corner for your tag. I cut the right. ring off in the positioning. And I'll never forget mid, like after I did that spot, like Buddy Landell goes, good fucking spot, <laughs> kid. <laughs> like, he goes, God damn, you're a good heel. And that made me so fucking happy. <laughs> And so, like, we get through the match and get to the back, and in the back, he's just, like, he's elated because all he had to do was just really walk out with his fucking faux nature boy robe and just sit on the apron and watch this young kid take all the fucking bumps. 
do all the fucking work. All he had to do is just yell at some old ladies to shut up. And like, he just loved every bit of it. And he told me back, he's like, man, you're such a good heel, man. You are such a good heel. And just went on and on and on and on. Well, the next match, if we had this little person that usually wrestled on Stan Lee's shows, and we always would put him in different matches, but he was never, he was no Hornswoggle. He was no Masquerita Sagrada. I'll tell you that much. He was no El Torito, which is the same person. But he, he, he did give uh, Charlie Dreamer an, uh, an FU because we, he, he did a mini Cena wow. character. <laughs> In, in 2007, 2006, having a mini oh, scene on your huge, show, huge. trust me. We sold so many fucking spinner belts when that motherfucker was there. Like, I had to love him. He had a lisp. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, we, 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 kept, we kept him out of the ring and away from uh, the microphone as much as possible. We just, we just gave him a John Cena shirt and tore him to tip his hat and give him a fucking chain. And if he could have you know rapped, though. Oh, my God. Please tell me he did You Can't See Me because he was so short. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. We did all of that. We did all the little person spots. And also very similar to Buddy Landell, if he got hurt, it was a big calamity. So he was the match just after us. I'm having this wonderful conversation with Buddy Landell. It's like the first time that Buddy hasn't talked about Christianity in the last 15 to 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, Mini Cena comes to the back. And he's he I guess he did something to hurt his back and he like gets to the back and he goes, My big my big my big and then collapses for attention. <laughs> he's like on the ground just writhing. And as I'm sta- as, as this little person dressed like John Cena <laughs> is all on the ground, nature boy, Buddy Landell, goes, Hey guys, let's pray wow. on him. Not let's get a medical attention, let's get a doctor in here. Let's pray on him. So then him, and obviously Buddy's new best friend, the guy wearing the Rey Mysterio <laughs> replica mask, flying cross wow. or whatever, they go over and they put hands oh, on him. This is all happening in my feet. I have the nature boy, Buddy Landell. I have a knockoff <laughs> little person dressed as John Cena. I have a guy who wrestled out there in a replica of Rey Mysterio mask. I'm in Southwest Virginia right now, and they are preying on him as opposed to giving him medical attention. And I'm like, this can only fucking happen in professional <laughs> wrestling. And this is the most glorious day that I've ever had. Like, that is a top 10 memory in my fucking life, is I have the nature boy, Buddy Landell, preying on a fucking <laughs> little person to heal his back ailment. Oh, life's weird. So, uh, the last match... Recorded, anyways, on goodoldcagematch.com is uh, November 2010. Buddy is in a six man tagging with Cameron Valentine and Greg Valentine, taking on Brutus Beefcake, Jake Roberts, and one of our best episodes, Brick House Brown in Birmingham, Alabama. Man, that's a team. Then Buddy's passing's just so brutal and weird. On uh, June 21st, 2015, he was in a car crash. The doctors apparently just missed something because he was released from the hospital. He went home, went to bed, and never woke up. And we lost Buddy Landell at the age of 53. It's Yeah, the doctors had to miss something, man. That's so scary just as an older gentleman getting older. of <laughs> just like, no, nah, you're fine. Go home. Everything's going to be great. Cool. I'm going to go to sleep. It's just reading that the first time really freaked me out. So, final thoughts on Buddy Landell. I think it's a possibility that maybe Buddy Landell is bipolar. Because you get, like, in wrestling, this guy who clearly loved it. He was clearly a fan from the time he grew up. He strived to be good at it, to become a star. He was good in the ring, so he obviously cared. And then on the flip side, you get a guy who doesn't even respect pro wrestling enough to show up to become the fucking man it's just such a weird duality and then you you can even see it in his shoots there's the shoot where he's wearing like his wcw hat it's like blue he's sitting on a blue bench the dude is he's like a fun loving here's my stories he was very uh, like repentive of a lot of his sins and how he treated his wife and he admitted over and over again how like yeah i fucked that one up and then he has this other shoot where he's more bitter he's like confidently using the n-word which uh, really turned me off of him 
so it's like you, you have this such hot and cold side of him it's seemingly in in every aspect of his life and if that's the reason he ruined his career that's so sad because you know like mental health is barely a thing now it definitely wasn't in the 80s you know arn anderson called him one of the top three what ifs of all time and if you just skim through his career you can see that that's 100 percent true he was a master of that like old school Southern wrestling style. And, you know, he said over and over in his shoots, I'm no Lex Luger. I don't have a Lex Luger body. And he didn't, but some of his punches looked like he could just blow your head off your body. Like he was so good at just the smallest details in wrestling. He was a good talker, heat magnet. He's just such a troll. He knew, especially using the whole nature boy, pretty boy thing. I mean, he just got it. I hate the stories of dudes fixing their lives and then dying in some weird ass way, like the Sam Kennisons, the Candidos, you know, buddies right there where, you know, he seemed to rededicate his life to being a, a better person. And then he just gets fucking taken out in this stupid car wreck. It's just so sad. But, you know, he made an impact on the sport. His handprints are there, whether you know it or not. And it's just fucking just a bummer, man. I still say he's one of the, the one of the best punch sellers that ever was. Look up on YouTube Jerry Lawler versus Buddy. There's a twenty there's a thirty second clip on YouTube of Lawler going off on Buddy in the corner and he literally punches him for over twenty seconds in a sequence. And it is the best fucking punching sequence I've probably ever seen. It sounds like hyperbole, but look it up on YouTube. It is a work of fucking art between those two. Also, underrated as shit, weird superlative to give but buddies when he would sell a back body drop the way he would arch his head up and look up at the lights before tucking in and falling always looked like gold man it was so gorgeous last night i watched george south versus buddy 8 17 95 and i thought it'd be another kind of jobber squash match or whatever but please go look this up and watch this match it's probably about five to seven minutes but george and buddy go back and forth George gets hops on everything that he does because that crowd hates the shit out of Buddy. And every little thing that George does to get an advantage, the crowd loves their ass off. It's one of the best kind of shorter matches I, uh, that I watched throughout all the Buddy research. Um, one thing we didn't bring up, which is kind of what Buddy's kind of known for along the Flair stuff, is Flair's legendary spilt liquor promo, which is, is just one of the best. One thing that he did better than Flair was the Flair flop, I think, because Buddy would do the Flair flop into a turnbuckle, which is a bump that I think could seriously injure your neck and your spine if you fuck it up, but Buddy would nail the hell out of it. I have a lot of the same thoughts that Nick did. It's uh, that first promo in the WCW hat, or sorry, the first shoot in the WCW hat where he's sitting on his couch in Charlotte. He comes off like the best dude. It's, I think it's around like 98 or 99. And he comes off like he, he he just, he fucked up. He really regrets how he screwed over Dusty and Flair and all them. And then like later, it just seems like things go bad because apparently like bad stuff happened with his kids, which I understand. But it just seems like it, he started blaming other people and I don't know if it just added up on him. It sucked to see because that, that, that one shoot interview in the WCW hat buddy is such a fucking good dude hilarious everything about him's great man and yeah i mean just what could have been what could have been what could have been i don't know how else to end this but just stressing the windows in life are small as shit buddy fucked up multiple windows he kept getting back there because he had talent but if you don't have discipline and you don't really hone your talent and really work it doesn't mean shit man just god don't just don't squander the opportunities you have in life because this shit's short it's probably good that I'm going last because, like, you guys hit on some stuff, and, and it's the two laces, and hopefully I tie this into a nice little bow here at the end. You know, Nick mentioning that you know maybe he's bipolar because he's all over the place. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't go quite that far, but there's definitely that sense of whatever you want out of Buddy in that particular moment, he'll give you. He won't give you an actual thing. Like, there's this old wrestler mentality, especially with shooting reviews, like, oh, you want me to tell you a story? I'll give you the most hardcore story. I right. did this, I fucked up like this, and then I pulled out a shotgun. <laughs> right. You know, like, I mean, that, that that's the thing of a lot of things of when you look back at that Dynamite Kid interview that people, like, were brought up in the CNN special, like that, 
sometimes wrestlers have this thing of like, oh yeah, well I was so fucked up I did this, or I was so fucked up I was drunk driving down the mountains in West Virginia with sunglasses <laughs> on and didn't give a fuck and swerving as going 100 miles per hour because fuck everybody, when really you didn't do that. You were just trying to make this story sound more hardcore, come off, where like if they're in a calm mood, they're like, hey, they're very personable and they're wherever. It's, it's sometimes that wrestler thing, you get caught in gears. But I, I do agree that there is some sort of mental health thing going on, for sure. I, I, I wouldn't label it specifically that, but I do agree with you, Nick, that there's something mental health-wise going on. But also, too, you got to look at Buddy came from basically kind of nothing. You know, like, he grew up poor, and we see it all the time with pro athletes. They get some money, and especially a lot of those territory guys— they basically got into pro wrestling because they didn't have anything else or they loved pro wrestling and they didn't want to do anything else and they finally did it and they're making money and the idea of saving it, you know, because when you get a vocation and a trade, you feel like, like if you become a carpenter, you're like, I'm going to be a carpenter until I die. I found out what I want to do and I'm passionate about it. Much like I'm a pro wrestler and I do it and you never take in consideration that this may stop. You don't realize that your body is your commodity and your commodity runs out because if you're a carpenter, you're never going to run out of wood. You're never going to run out of work. You don't think that as a pro wrestler. And we see it all the time with pro athletes. They never think about the long game. And for somebody that was sleeping in the back of the ring truck to all of a sudden main eventing in Puerto Rico and other territories, and now you're making money, and you're like, man, for four years, this fucking shit sucked. Well, now it's fucking awesome. So I'm going to live it up because I got it. Why not? You know, I might not get this again because I know what it's like to not get this. So I want to make sure that while I have it, I get, I do it. But where I think the mental health stuff kind of wraps in is the self-destruction and the idea of staying in comfort levels. Like the fact of like we talk about like why didn't he just not be the nature boy? You know, why didn't he switch from that? It was that comfort level. I think he goes through some of the issues that I have in that he didn't love himself enough. He could never see good in himself. You know, he stayed the nature boy because... He knows that he'll always be second best as the nature boy. That's more comforting to him. Him fucking up, he he loved that because then he could be like, well, I didn't get this really wonderful thing that I've always wanted to work towards because I fucked up. He's got that excuse he can hang, kind of hang on to because if he didn't fuck up and he was successful, now there's expectations. Now you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. Sometimes like, and, and we don't talk about this, especially with performers, entertainers, um, and it's something that I'm exploring a lot too, is sometimes success is terrifying. It scares you to fucking death and you'd much rather hang on to the excuses why you're a failure because that's comforting. Because you're like, oh, I know exactly why I failed because I fucked up. As opposed to I wasn't good enough. That's more terrifying. Like what happens if you actually try and you find out you're actually not good enough? That's scary. So why don't I create a mistake to prevent that from happening? Or even the worst part, what if I am successful and I feel like a fucking fraud? Like, what if I'm successful because I was lucky, not because I was good? That's fucking scary, too. And then what happens if, like, you become a success and somebody just fucking takes that away from you? Or what if you could become a successful? When's that next bad, bad thing coming? That's fucking scary, too. Like, you don't realize how terrifying success is. And Buddy was probably one of those guys that was terrified and was almost running from it his entire career. That's why it's like, hey, pin me, pay me. Great. I don't care. Keep me in this middle spot. I'm comfortable there. The idea of getting outside of his comfort zone, working main events and understanding the responsibilities of that. That's fucking terrifying. That's scary. And that's something that I myself am working through myself because I don't want to fucking do this for 17 years. And I don't want to fucking survive and hold this all together the 17 year career through a fucking pandemic and then have it turn out to be a failure. If wrestling ever does come back, if we get a vaccine and all of a sudden wrestling come back to what it was before, I don't want to go through all that that I fucking went through already for me to be a fucking failure or not believe in myself enough to be a success. Like that's kind of why I sought the mental health that I did. And I don't think buddy ever got that. And he clearly needed it because you know, self-destruction, you can just say, oh, he's unreliable or this or whatever. But sometimes it's because you just simply don't fucking believe in yourself. And he was clearly stuck in that. And it's a shame his career never got out of that. But I hope he got some sort of peace in the end, which maybe it, it gave him the peace at the end. Maybe he said it was good enough or I, the, the fact that he said I could have got more. But, like, man, life, as Michael said, life is too short. Why 
why leave it to what if, you know, it'd rather be like, you did it or you didn't do it, you know, and just live with that. It's a tough thing. All right. Well, that is Buddy's episode. Uh, Thank you guys for listening. I keep forgetting to plug this and people quit doing it. Uh, Leave us a rating and review, please. We haven't done that in 30 episodes, so if you could do that. (laughs) Please check us out on patreon.com slash timbellpod where you can support our show here. Uh, You guys got anything? I think we should end on the words of Buddy himself. There's only one L at the end of Landale, and there's only one nature boy. Mibic! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Man Scout, Jake Manning. Thank you very much for listening to 10 Bell Pod. I can't thank you guys enough for being subscribers and people who leave reviews, but also, too, big, big thank you to people who are our patrons on Patreon. Now, some of you may be hearing that like, wait a minute, I'm not a a patron on a Patreon for you guys. And you might be like, hey, I want to do that. I want it. And I want an extra thank you. I left a review. I subscribe, but I want an extra thank you from the Man Scout Jake Manning because that third thank you doesn't apply to you unless you are a patron on our Patreon page. Make sure you check it out at patreon.com slash 10 bell pod.